So right now we're going to take a read of mine that I decided after the first day that I clipped it and started scraping on it was worth keeping around. And the way I decided that was because it seemed to be fitting the definition of a good piece of cane well enough. That is, it seemed to be responding to the work that I was doing to it, and it wasn't really changing back to the way that it was. So the first thing that I did before playing a note on this read is I turned on my tuner. Now this is sort of a mental game with myself because I've found, as I'm sure many of us have, that sometimes you're playing on a read and it feels really good. And you sort of arrive at this point where you say to yourself, I don't really want to know if this read is out of tune. Unfortunately, that's information that we have to have. So it's information that I choose not even to give myself the option of remaining ignorant of. So I've got the read here. And I'm just going to test it. So this read is clearly not particularly responsive. And what's more, it's quite sharp. Most of the range of the instrument, at least the range that I tested, hovered around 20 cents sharp or so. So that question of intonation is the first thing I'm going to address. And the reason that I'm addressing the intonation before the response is that if a reed isn't naturally playing in tune, very likely the response is not going to be there either. In other words, it's very difficult, you might say impossible, to really gauge the quality of response on a reed before it's in the ballpark intonation-wise. So what I'm going to do in order to bring down the pitch on this reed is I'm going to scrape close to the center of the reed, in other words, close to the spine, sort of in the front third of the reed. And I'm marking with a pencil exactly where I'm going to scrape. And that is at these pencil marks and at these pencil marks. And the reason that I'm a little ways back from the tip is that I'm looking to scrape as close to the tip as possible, because I find that that yields the most immediate effect, but not so much out of one area near the tip that I compromise the quality of the tapers from the center to the sides. In other words, if I scraped way, way, way too much along the spine near the tip of the reed, there comes a point where I can no longer taper from the center down to the sides, because the center is already so thin that my only option is to keep things flat. So now I'm taking my file and I'm just focusing where I have those pencil marks. And once I work there, I then take that work and I make sure that it's incorporated nicely into tapers to the corners.
Now, something that you may have noticed is that I'm taking even work that I'm doing here and I'm tapering it to there, not from here to there. The reason for that is that I'm intentionally leaving the rails heavy because I've found that taking too much out of the rails too early on tends to make a reed irreparably stuffy and unresponsive. So by leaving the rails intentionally heavy, I allow myself at the very, very final finishing stages of the reed to then slowly and carefully refine those until the tenor register is right where I want it. Now, let's see if the work we just did had any effect. So the reed has come down in pitch. It's now closer to about 15 cents sharp, but not substantially. And so here's an example of this sort of sliding scale of whether a reed is responding to the work that we're doing to it and whether it's changing back. Because this is not a black and white thing. It's not binary. It's not that a reed either responds or it doesn't. So this read is kind of responding, which for me does not show a whole lot of promise. But I'm not certain yet that this read is not a good piece of cane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the, into the same areas that I just worked on and do more, because more work is necessary in those areas. And then I'm also going to just do a general scrape over the back two thirds of the reed, incorporating that into the work that I've already done in the front third, because the reed just generally feels a little bit too heavy and, and generally quite resistant. Now, it may be apparent at this point that I'm taking more cane off this time than I was last time. That's because last time I was choosing to approach this read with the assumption that it was going to respond very rapidly to the work that I did to it. At this point, I know better. And so I'm taking quite a bit of cane out of this read because I know that if it's going to turn into anything, that's what's necessary based on the fact that it did not rapidly respond to the work that I've already done to it. Now again, as I'm doing this general scrape, one area that I am being careful to stay away from as much as possible is the rails. Because when doing one of these overall scrapes, 
it's very easy to accidentally take a lot of cane off of the rails and again compromise the responsiveness of the reed beyond repair. So when I first put the reed on the instrument just now, it played in tune. When I put the bassoon back in the stand, the reed played 20 cents sharp. This is the definition of a reed that responds to the work that we do to it, but changes back. As such, this reed is no longer of use to me. Now, I just want to spend some time talking about what we just did with our ill-fated read. The most notable of which is probably just sort of unceremoniously throwing it into the trash at the end. The reason I made a point of doing that, A, is because that's what I would actually do, and B, it's because I find it healthiest for me to think of the point where I've decided that a read is not going to be of use to me. To think of that point as a point of release rather than as a point of failure. I find it just healthier for myself to think of it from the standpoint of I never have to worry about this read that is ultimately only going to make my life worse rather than what could have been. Okay, the, the other element of the work that we just did on this read that I think is really important but may not have been immediately obvious is that I was making a conscious concerted effort every time I put the read on the instrument and, and played on it to be very unflinchingly honest with myself about how that read was playing, particularly in this case what the pitch of the read was. Because while I could have compensated for it, and played it in tune, and called it good enough. I know through experience that in a more difficult context, in a high pressure situation, in a setting where I have to play very softly, maybe after having sat for a while, in a situation in which I'm getting very tired, that I very quickly lose the ability to compensate in that way for a reed's deficiencies. It's not that you lose them entirely, but particularly as regards pitch. It becomes very, very difficult once you're in hour six of Parsifal to just will yourself to stop the inevitable pinching that, that has begun to happen somewhat. Now, given that I set standards for this read that the read did not need. The next logical question is, how many of my reads do not meet those standards? And in my experience, it comes out to about five out of six. Only about one out of six reads that I clip, on average, ever make it into my good read box that goes to the Met with me, that, that I am willing to eventually play in front of people. And I want to make something very clear about that. I'm not in any way implying judgment on others who have a different, often higher yield than me, or who have any
processes that are that are different from mine, who place values on their reads that are different from mine. I'm only sharing what works for me and what I've found is necessary for me to do my job. Now, given that only one out of six reads that I clip ever makes it to see the light of day, what that means for me is that I have to make a lot of reads. And so my sort of pipeline that I aim to maintain, I don't always succeed, but I try, is to clip about two reads per day. Now, in order to make this manageable, I do all of my cane processing and as much of my blank making over the summer as possible so that every day I can just sit down, clip my two reads, the majority of which do not make it to see a second day, and move on with my day. That being said, even aiming to clip 14 reads a week, uh, given the demands of, of playing in an opera orchestra, I still find that it, it usually feels like I have barely enough reads to, to do my job. And as such, somewhat paradoxically, I found that uh, I often end up playing on reads somewhat past their, let's say, expiration date. And the reason for that is there, there are many operas, let's take Marriage of Figaro for an example, that are very difficult to, to, to rotate a new read into because of how tiring it can be and how small variances in a read's, for example, sagginess in the tenor register can sort of compound over the span of, of an entire opera. Uh, you have to keep in mind the certainly the, the intonation of a read, but uh, also just the, the general touchiness of, of an opera like Figaro, where you have to be so aware and so trusting of your tenor register to just sit there for hours in often very soft, very sensitive passages that I've found that often it's better to gradually performance after performance, if we have 10, 12, 15 figaros, to just gradually compensate slightly more in each performance for a read. And what this is really getting at is that I make every effort not to compensate for a read at the read desk, because I want to see with sort of unflinching honesty what a read inherently wants to do and if that meets what I know to be my standards for what I need to do my job. That's at the read desk. When I get into a performance situation, when I'm playing with or for other people, that flips. Because at that point, I believe very strongly that our job is to do whatever is necessary to make a read sound as good as possible. To put slightly more air behind a note if you know that it doesn't want to respond. Similarly, in certain passages, to sort of cushion it with your articulation that much more. To realize, okay, this read may be drifting slightly up in pitch, so I have to really police myself to ensure that I'm not letting that get too high to the point where I sound sharp relative to my colleagues, to where my colleagues are having to come up to me. This is a, an important part of our job as performers that is very literally the, the, the mirror image, the, the sort of flip side of the coin from what we have to do at the read desk.